Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll give it a few minutes as we wait for everyone to slowly filter in and make yourself comfortable in front of the screen for what we hope will be an awesome session today. Great to see everyone saying hello in the chat. That will be where you're able to ask us questions, leave comments and uh, encourage everyone throughout this session. People joining from all over the world. This is so exciting. Mauritius, Bangladesh, South Korea, Malaysia. Welcome, welcome everyone. Yes, it's a very conference-friendly time for us in the Asia-Pacific region at the moment, being 7 p.m. in the evening. But for those of you joining at a much, much less sociable hour, thank you for giving us your time. We hope it is worth your uh, early morning slash late night. Lebanon, Sri Lanka, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Germany and Sweden I saw, Italy, Tunisia, Malta's here. <laughs> Really, lots and lots of different places. Fantastic. We might make a start now with some quick housekeeping. So welcome to this exciting session on global citizenship education, responsibilities and activism in a world pandemic and to the Global Youth Summit at large. Some of you are joining us through the Juno platform and many more are joining through the live broadcast and multiple social media channels. So a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, here's our housekeeping before we kick off the session. Uh, first, Please note that this session is part of the Global Youth Summit and we strongly encourage you to explore other sessions in any one of the three tracks each day of the summit. Uh, by joining this session, everyone who will have the opportunity to speak consents to their image and audio being broadcasted. By participating in the Global Youth Summit, you've agreed to behave professionally, respectfully and be culturally sensitive towards other people to promote the principles of respect, diversity and inclusion, as well as to actively prevent and not engage in abusive behaviour of any kind that leads to any harm, prejudice, discrimination or harassment against any person. If you do not adhere to these principles or the summit's code of conduct, you'll be removed from the session and potentially banned from the entire event and the organisation that nominated you will be notified of your actions. We have a safeguarding team moderating our interactions on the Juno platform, uh, the live broadcast chat function and all social media channels. Should you at any point feel unsafe or witness concerning behaviour, please reach out by sending an email to safe at globalyouthmobilisation.org. You may also get in touch with our support team at the virtual help desk. All information emailed to the email address will be kept private and confidential. Now that we've uh, done that, hello, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us from all over the world for this session. Uh, my name's Erin Wicking and I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people in Melbourne, Australia. I'm here representing the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, known as WAGS. WAGS is the largest global organisation dedicated to girls and young women, supporting over 10 million young people from 152 countries. 
Through her experience in the movement, any and every girl can develop the skills and knowledge that she needs to raise her voice, defend her ideas and contribute to shaping a better world. I'm proud to be the WAG's lead volunteer for girl-led advocacy and influence. And today I'm delighted to be presenting this session alongside Julia. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. Thanks for the great introduction and for the housekeeping. Hello, everyone. It's very exciting to join you today. My name is Julia Zimmerman, and I'm joining you from Vienna, Austria, in Europe. I am joining you on behalf of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, which is a quasi-international organization based here in Austria that works to empower youth and women to be active stakeholders, engage global citizens for the sustainable development goals and a sustainable future for us all. To kick us off today, we have some questions, some polling. So I'll quickly be sharing my screen. And you will see at the bottom of your screen, now you'll see that it has popped up and I encourage you to click on the small expand screen in the bottom right hand corner so that the question pops up nice and big for you on your screen. Now you'll see this Mentimeter poll has popped up. If you go to www.menti.com and use the code 21949058, you can already start participating. And this is completely anonymous. So please just share your inputs and get excited. Tell us how is the summit so far for you? You've already had one day, it's launched, and now you're in your second day at the start of your second day. How's it going so far? How is it? I'll give you a few minutes to, to log on and to get started. Oh, I start seeing, great, exciting, inspiring. I like it, <laughs> great, so good to hear. Very inspiring seems to be a very prime word so far. Great, fun, curious, informative, a little sleepy. It's early for some of us, sure. Great, <laughs> full of energy. Oh, great to see that everyone's learning so much already and feeling inspired, having fun, interesting, heartwarming, empowering, educational. Wow, look at all these great words to express your interest in the sessions and everything going on. Give you a few more seconds to share your, your words of, of interest in the, in the summit so far. A new try, something nice, enlightening, motivational. Good, I'm glad that this is motivating and we're hoping that our session can also bring that motivation for you as well. Great, okay, I'm sure there's so many other words you could think of, but let's go ahead and move on to the next one. What are you hoping to gain from this session? So Erin already said that our session is global citizenship education, responsibilities, and activism in a world pandemic. What do you hope to gain from this session? What are you hoping to walk away with? Treasure. Mm -hmm. For this one, you can give a short answer. So anything that, that comes to mind, new ideas, how to take action in the pandemic, learn more about becoming an activist, mm -hmm. more motivation and inspiration. So continuing on the themes of the summit so far, information, ideas, Solutions, ideas, great. Knowledge, mm -hmm. A new outlook to see the world in a new way. Global citizenship insights, how to be active and support our community. Raising voices, be more educated and informed, experiences for doing activism, enlightenment. Applying to local settings, best practices, well, I can tell you, we have a lot of what you say here coming up in the session. So I think we hit the nail on the head, Erin. I think we've got it. <laughs> Great. So Sounding positive. It <laughs> sounds very positive. I think we'll be able to definitely give you some inspiration, motivation, best practices, tools, all those things in this session. So stay tuned. So first things first, the run of show today is going to be a bit about global citizenship and the sustainable development goals by me. And then I'll pass it back to Erin for her to talk to you about the leadership um, model of the WAGs. 
And then we'll move on to some resources. We'll have a short break, and then there'll be a panel with a couple young activists who are making a difference in their communities for the sustainable development goals as global citizens. And these young activists will be joining us for a short panel, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. So please be prepared to write your questions in the chat and to engage with us after that. So first things first, we're going to talk about global citizenship and the sustainable development goals and what that means. This is a nice picture here with some of our global citizen scholars and they're each holding one of these fantastic panels. And I brought one of my favorite ones with me today, which is SDG4 for education and global citizenship education, which is under SDG target 4.7. But we'll get more into that in a second. So keeping the engagement going, I wanna know, do you identify as a global citizen? Okay, right out the gates, there's some yeses. That's fantastic. All right. Some are thinking about it, some are thinking. Looks like so far many of you are identifying as a global citizen. I'll give you another second to put in your answers. Hmm. We have a maybe, that's perfectly fine. Maybe by the end of this session, you will consider yourself a global citizen. Let's see. Great, so generally I see that most of you already consider yourself to be global citizens. And there are a few of you that think, hmm, maybe I'm not sure exactly what it means. Perhaps I am a global citizen, or maybe I want to become one, but I don't know exactly how yet. Well, let's see if we can answer those things. What do you think it means to be a global citizen? What does it require? What skills, what personality, what values? What do you think it requires? What do you think it means? Mm hmm. Globally sided, locally minded. I don't know. That's fair. That's fair. If you don't know, that's what we're going to help you answer. Understanding. Mm hmm. To get yourself linked with different parts of the globe through friendship. I like that through friendship, partaking in activism to help people around the world. Work for your community, a person who is involved in global problems and solution making to be responsible feeling responsible and being part of the whole. Value everyone's voice, to have a part in society, communication, awareness and understanding, appreciate diversity, a citizen who presents the world, to take responsibility in the world you're in, making borderless changes. I don't know, fine, perfectly fine. Being culturally aware and sensitive, acceptance and flexibility. A global citizen is, some, citizen is someone who's aware of and understands the wider world and their place in it. The actions we do impact globally. Well, wow, these are very, very good ideas. And thank you for being so um, engaged and for sharing. I would next take the opportunity to share a little bit about global citizenship and how it's been defined even by the UN, the United Nations. UNESCO identifies and defines global citizenship um, as referring to a sense of belonging to a broader community, a common humanity. It emphasizes political, economic, social, and cultural interdependency and interconnectedness between the local, the national, and the global. So this idea of seeing beyond borders and seeing yourself as a broader community, first and foremost, as a part of a global community, I think is fantastic. And that's exactly as, as, as should be seen. And that you can then see the challenges also that go beyond maybe even just your own community and affect others. It's someone who upholds the, the understandings of the United Nations Charter, of the, the Human Rights Doctrine, of the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Agreement, and other frameworks that are meant to help us work together internationally to make the world a better place. And within this, we have the idea of global citizenship education, which is a very specific type of education, which is meant to help young people, but all the way through adults and continued learning, develop the needed cognitive, socio-emotional skills and behavioral skills to contribute and give back. So to take action as a global citizen, as someone who holds those values, we need to develop these skills. So cognitive skills include 
um, your knowledge and thinking necessary to understand the world and its complexity. So understanding things like climate change and how, how the earth needs to be protected better or understanding our oceans and what we need to do for this. Cognitive, so knowledge and thinking skills necessary to better understand the world. Socio-emotional skills, so values and attitudes and social skills that enable learners to develop effectively, psychologically and physically and to enable them to live together with others respectfully and peacefully. So I saw that in the in the polling, you also mentioned ex accepting diversity and appreciating others. Exactly that, so that we are learning how to expect um, to, to be socially emotionally connected, to be empathetic with others. And then behavioral, so this is then taking action and being able to to actually take action for sustainable development, both through formal education opportunities um, and conduct performance, practice application and engagement. So the Ban Ki-moon Center empowers young global citizens like many of you have identified today to take action for sustainable development, both through formal education opportunities and informal workshops and trainings. We promote global citizenship education and see transformative education as key to achieving the sustainable development goals. So I hope with that, it gives you some idea of what it actually means, global citizenship, the idea of global citizenship education, which is the theme of today's discussions. And now I will pass uh, to, back to Erin for some information about, global citizen, about being a leader and an activist in the world pandemic. Erin, over to you. Thank you, Julia. So we've heard that uh, the SDGs are obviously a a global set of goals for us to work together to achieve and therefore global citizenship is what's required for us to achieve the SDGs. But we also believe that achieving the sustainable development goals requires meaningful youth participation through intergenerational leadership. So today I'm going to ask you to reimagine what you know about leadership. So for WAGS, the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, Leadership is a shared journey that empowers us to work together and bring positive change to our lives, the lives of others, and our wider society. We see a good leader as someone who is a lifelong learner, who consciously deepens their understanding of different contexts, draws on different wisdoms, and uses that learning to collaborate with others to make a difference. We believe that taking part in Girl Guiding and Girl Scouting enables girls to build a foundation of leadership practice, confidence and life skills through a learning journey that they are shaping themselves. So they set their own goals, pursue them at their own pace. They get to know themselves and understand exactly what it is that they need to thrive. And as they grow up, Girl Guides and Girl Scouts use this experience to take the lead in their own lives and they can pass on what they've gained as volunteer youth leaders within our movement and also within a lot of other organisations represented here in, in the session today. Uh, and as global citizens, uh, really taking action uh, for what is important to them. Now, when you think leadership, you probably think along the lines of most traditional leadership models and programs, which are really based on specific skills and knowledge and abilities that you're so, supposed to develop that enables you to become a good leader. And our experience of witnessing and supporting girls' leadership journeys shows us that although competencies can be important, it's actually your values and your perspectives and behaviours as a leader that really matters more. So we don't think there's a universal list that says this is the set of global leadership traits that would automatically make someone a great leader because we know that leadership is a phenomenon that's really rooted in context. It's a lived experience and interactive process that's happening within a group of people at a certain time and in a certain place. Uh, so today I'm excited to share with you our leadership model, which we refer to as a model of leadership practice. And when we say leadership practice, what we mean is that it's daily behaviours that you choose to engage in to put your values into action and create a positive change. So leadership practice regards your ways of being and thinking about the world as the foundation of you as a leader. And the best way to work on this foundation is consciously and actively practicing leadership. So in our Girl Guide and Girl Scout leadership model, we use a system of six different mindsets as the main tools to make leadership practice become something that's conscious. And so each mindset is like a window that we can look through 
we can get different perspectives and it will consciously influence our reactions, our reflections, our choices, and all of our behaviours. And so we believe that by using these six leadership mindsets as tools, we can draw meaning from experiences, become more aware of our own leadership practice, and really internalise good leadership behaviours until they become a habit and just a part of who we are as a leader. So the mindsets take us on a journey and it really uses reflection to draw meaning from experience, explore the meaning from all kinds of different angles and translate that learning into real responsible action. So the relevance of each mindset changes according to the situation that you're in uh, and we can draw on different mindsets or combinations of them at different times. And as we grow as a person and as a leader, we deepen our understanding of this model by practicing leadership. So there's an image on your screen at the moment and it's got our six different mindsets. So I'm going to really briefly introduce you to what each of those mindsets are and then we're actually going to take part in a leadership scenarios quiz. So the first mindset is the reflective mindset and this is about leading yourself. So it's about drawing meanings from your past experiences and thinking about your behaviour and its impact. Our second is a collaborative mindset. It's about leading relationships. So it brings together different perspectives and inspires consensus around a shared vision. The third one is our creative and critical thinking mindset. And this is all about leading for innovation. So it's creating an environment where both innovation and inquiry are valued. Then we have the gender equality mindset, obviously something that's very important uh, within Girl Guiding and Girl Scouting. And this is all about leading the girls empowerment. So it's about taking gender into account when you're practicing leadership and challenging gender stereotypes where you see them. We have a worldly mindset, which is about leading in context. And we've already seen some great comments in the chat about global citizenship and needing to think with a worldly mindset. So this is about getting inside the worlds of others, understanding their needs and their concerns more deeply. And finally, our last one, which is also very heavily tied to this idea of being a global citizen, and that's the responsible action mindset. It's about leading for impact. So it's mobilising energy around what needs changing and around what needs to be protected. So to help you engage with these mindsets, which are obviously not exclusive to um, Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, these are six mindsets that we're hoping you can take with you and use in your everyday life so that you can start having a quality leadership practice through all the things that you're doing. So we're going to be taking a short quiz. So in this quiz, we'll also be using the Menti platform. Uh, so you can see the link to the platform and the code is at the top of the screen there uh, so that you can log in uh, and use that code to get access. And so we'll have six questions in this quiz. Each one you have the options of answers A, B or C. And then after each question, we'll have a look at how many people in, in our group selected each answer and we'll talk about what that answer says about your leadership. So we'll start off with question uh, number one, uh, which Julia's hovered over there. So imagine that it's 1908 and your brother, he got a new book for Christmas and it was called Adventures for Boys. It was about learning life skills, camping, making new friends. And it sounds like heaps of fun and you want to take part. But people say adventures, they're not for girls. So what do you do? You can see you've got three options there, joining the group, creating a group of your own, advocating for girls to be allowed to join the existing group. And as we can see straight away, we've got people selecting all different answers. And it's because we know there, there isn't just one answer here. This is our mindset when it comes to leadership. And we're all, even though we're looking at this through a gender equality lens, We've all got our own way of approaching this problem. So that's a look. So, so far I can see 10 so far who've answered A. 
And what A says about you is that you're convinced that changing people's attitudes is the best way to take action for equality. You think about the people you see every day, have you heard some of them speak badly of girls, and you find arguments that could help change their minds. In B, it says, you're the kind of leader that doesn't want to waste any time. When you see an injustice, you just immediately want to take action. You're thinking about everything that's unfair to girls in your life and, and maybe thinking of other ways you can take action to tackle barriers. And look at this, what a great group of uh, active advocates it looks like we already have in the session. All these people, 36 so far, who have answered C. You guys are about the big picture. You're saying girls should be treated equally to boys. So use that to think about girls' rights in your country and maybe what you could do next to advocate to ensure that girls have the same rights and the same opportunities as boys. Okay, we'll move to question two uh, in our quiz. Okay, this is looking at our responsible action mindset. So you've got to imagine that you go to a school where lunch is prepared and you recently discovered that the school throws away all of the leftover food. You want to do something about the food waste, but the director of the school told you that there's nothing they can do about it. How are you acting? What are you choosing to do here? There's lots of excess food. You want to ensure it's not wasted. You want to make sure people are educated about the fact that this is what's going on in your school. Or maybe you're thinking about the bigger picture. Is, is this happening in everyone's school? Is this something that we could change on a larger scale? And again, I'm not surprised. I'm seeing a lot happening in that column C, uh, really right up there. So yes, and some, someone said in the chat here, it's different perspectives of different types of leadership. And that's absolutely right, because even though we're looking at this through the same mindset, you know, we all have different approaches that we're bringing to it. So the people that have answered A, they're the kind of people that get motivation from knowing that they're being useful in their community. They think about everything they're already doing and they find ideas to have a bigger impact. In the pink column in C, they're leaders who like to mobilise other people. They're thinking about how they can inspire even more people to be responsible citizens. And in column C, these people, these are leaders who are not afraid of change. And just because something has always been done a certain way, doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. So they're already thinking about what they could do to improve in their life or the life of others by just changing how things are done. All right, let's move on to our next mindset. And we are going to be uh, thinking using a worldly mindset, very appropriate for this diverse group of people we have today. So I want you to imagine you're 24 years of age and you're a summer volunteer on an international youth camp in Mexico. It's your first time there uh, in Mexico and you really want to soak it all up uh, and understand what's going on. How are you approaching this challenge? So have a look there at our options A, B and C and think how are you approaching this? You're in a different country, you're in a group with people from all over the world. How are you gonna play this out? And Julia might be able to hover back over the top there just so you can see the question for a bit longer because I know it disappeared. So you're surrounded by all these volunteers and participants from all these different countries. What's happening in your head while you're there? thinking with this worldly mindset in place. Jumping around there with all of the answers uh, again. So those people in the blue column, they're very curious. You're the kind of people that like to use all of the information you gather and put yourself in other people's shoes. You wanna know what's the daily life like here? Uh, do these uh, people have different opinions to you? And where could those opinions come from? People in column B, they're valuing every occasion to understand the context of everything that's happening around them and using that to adapt their behaviour. 
some things they do or say at home, you might realise that they're considered insensitive or just really weird somewhere else. And over in column C, these are our leaders who like to connect their actions to a bigger picture. So you're already thinking about what impact your group at home has locally on this community and how it connects into global citizenship. All right, we'll jump on to our fourth mindset now. This is our reflective mindset. So imagine that you're in school and you've just learned about an inspiring woman in your country. You're very impressed by her life and everything she's done and you want to follow her path. So what are you doing next? How are you approaching this? You've heard this uh, inspiring story. You think, gosh, I just need to act. So what is, what is that action that you are taking? So you're reflecting on this story, thinking, how can this make meaning for me? And we can see a lot's happening there in, in that middle column. Now we're jumping up. So in our blue column, these are leaders who are really in touch with their own feelings. So by continuing to pay attention to yourself and your emotions, it's going to help you become more aware of yourself and of other people. In our pink column, these are leaders who like to understand things in depth. So you're the kind of person that makes time in your life to think about your actions or the actions of others and the impact that they might be having. And in our last column, these are really curious leaders. So you just need to keep asking the right questions to try and understand how the context affects you and other people and your experiences. All right, moving on to our second last quiz question here. And we are looking at the creative and critical thinking mindset. So here's our scenario. It's your birthday and you had planned everything carefully to celebrate it with your friends, but nothing is going according to plan. You know what it feels like during these COVID times, you could substitute birthday for any kind of event. You could plan everything carefully and things are just changing every hour, every day at the moment. So what are you doing? You've got this plan. You thought right in my head, I've got this. This is going to be perfect. I just cannot wait for this to happen. It's just not working. So, in our blue column there, these are leaders who like to understand all aspects of the situation that they're placed in. So you're using the part of your mind to consider all of your options and you like to take informed risks. In our middle, middle column, we've got some innovators. You like to create space in your life for creativity because it will help you find ideas and solutions that nobody else might think of. And our most popular choice for this question, these guys, these are leaders who are people people. You're a people's person. You think about your friends and your family and you're thinking about how you can make them feel valued and safe in your presence. Always an amazing quality to have in a leader. All right, we're up to our last one now. And here it is. It's our collaborative mindset. Are such an important mindset to have when we're looking at things like the sustainability and the sustainable development goals and, and fighting this pandemic. So you're imagining that you're a youth group leader and two of your members are fighting. They won't talk to each other anymore, but you want them to be friends again. So what are you going to do? How are you going to help these young people to come back together as friends, to go back to that sense of achievement they had when they were collaborating and working together. And as a girl guide leader myself, I'd say this is a situation that I'm in regularly and that I think a, a lot of uh, other people here in this session who work with young people, um, especially if you're working with young people under the age of 18, you know, this is, this is something that regularly happens in, in young people's lives. 
So in our first column, we've got people who are reflecting on their actions. You like to think about the impact. It's very important to you. So you need to try to regularly take some time to think about your own behaviour, especially with others, work on what you want to improve and value all of the good things that you do. Wow, okay, look at that pink column, column B. These are leaders who are open to learning from others and their perspectives. You think of people in your life you'd like to know better and maybe it's time to start conversations with them. And in our last column, you're the kind of person that likes doing things in teams. And obviously that's a large part of social action, learning and having fun together. So you like to think about all the ways you can make sure that your team is open to different kinds of people and not just your friends, because you recognise that there is just so much to learn from other people. So there we have it. We've worked through six different mindsets and we've seen that even when we're all looking through the same lens, there are endless ways that we can, as a leader, approach each of these situations. Thank you for participating uh, so freely and openly. Um, it is great to see you all getting engaged. Uh, and yes, um, we can find a way to try and make this activity available after the session for sure. We will be talking later on about the resources that we've got uploaded to this Juno platform for you to be able to uh, go back over and look through. So you've just seen what we believe our leadership model to be, this idea that leadership is something that you practice. Leadership is behaviours that you learn and you just keep developing over time. So at WAGS, when we're thinking about community action and youth-led advocacy, the way we see it is we think that community action and youth advocacy, they're just natural byproducts of leadership practice. So by this, we mean that when given the opportunity to consciously practice leadership and to explore their place as both local and global citizens, young people naturally want to seek out issues and work to create lasting change. So today, I could think of nothing better than sharing with you some really incredible stories of how young people, Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, uh, under the age of 18, have put their leadership into practice by leading and participating in some really amazing community action projects. So I guess it's it's no secret that during the pandemic, young people worldwide have innovated and taken action, and it's really changed their fellow community members' COVID experiences for the better. Uh, so first, I'd like to share um, some stories of some cadet Girl Scouts of the United States of America. So my first story is about Samantha. She's an eighth grader and she's passionate about design and studies at a design-based high school. So she was already really lucky to have a small 3D printer at home and decided that she would design and print her own face masks to donate to frontline hospital workers. Now, face masks are something, whether 3D printed or made from cloth, they're a really popular project amongst young people, particularly Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. So we have another story of a cadet Girl Scout from America, this time Hannah, a seventh grader, and she used instructions that she found online to start sewing face masks to donate to her local hospital. And she even recruited her other troop members to join her. Now, the reason that she was able to recruit them so easy, uh, easily is that previously Hannah and her Girl Scout troop had learnt sewing skills so they used them in other community action projects. So they regularly made and donated T-shirt bags to the homeless community uh, and also uh, made quilts and blankets to donate to children in the same local hospital to try and help them feel comforted during their stay. Now, across Europe, Girl Guides and Girl Scouts jumped into action to support communities during COVID restrictions particularly uh, and there's a story out of the Slovak Republic where members work together to transport food and medicines for older or disabled community members. Uh, in France, they took a, a different tact uh, and members set up a postcard project so that they could send positive messages to the most isolated people in their communities. And in Poland, a teenage girl scout, Prisia, created a project called Chamomiles and Pansies. Now, what it actually was, was a project to help 
people at risk of domestic abuse, which was on the rise due to the lockdown measures. So the project involved her creating a fake shop on Facebook and by purchasing items at the shop, at-risk individuals could be put in contact with professional support, including psychologists, lawyers and the police, without raising the suspicion of their abusers. And this is a young person using social media for a purpose that it was probably never considered for. It is such critical and creative thinking there. Now, Girl Guides and Girl Scouts have a strong history of putting their citizenship and their leadership skills into practice in the face of natural and other disasters. So in the aftermath of last year's really horrific explosion in Beirut, teams of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts from all over Lebanon came to Beirut and they sprung into action. And in many cases, they were taking action even before the government assistance had reached those communities. So the streets were full of young people handing out food, water and cleaning supplies, performing first aid for mild injuries. And this is something that um, young people have a long history of doing uh, in the wake of natural and other disasters. So we have very similar stories looking back in, you know, Mexico, Nepal, Japan, Haiti, Southeast Asia, you know, after tsunamis and earthquake experiences, these young people just jump up and say, I'm ready to do something and I'm ready to do it now. Now, community action is by no means just restricted to times of global or local disasters. You can uh, have positive action in your community led by young people at any time. And by helping young people consciously practice leadership and explore their role as global citizens, we empower them to seek out the concerns of their communities and act to change them for the better. So my final story comes from the Susquehanna Girl Guides in South Africa. So there were rumours in their community that young people were being trafficked as they walked to school. And so attendance at school dropped quite rapidly. There was a group of Girl Guides aged between 10 and 14 years of age, 32 of them, and they decided to come together and act. And together they organised a march to raise awareness of the issue of child trafficking and how to take action to stop trafficking or seek justice for the trafficked. Now, the Girl Guides called different stakeholders. They called social workers, police, education officials, and they invited them to come together and join them in their march. And then they even organised a range of speakers at the end of the march to teach the community members about trafficking and what to do if they witnessed or suspected it. Now, because of the actions of these 32 young people, attendance at school began to rise again and more people were confident reporting not just trafficking but other concerns to their local police. So these are young people. They didn't stop and ask for permission to be able to change the world. They were leaders. They were global citizens. And through their experience in our movement, they knew their power as global citizens and they understood that they're a leader regardless of their age. And they have done some incredible things to change the world. And I dare say that the people in our event today are these kind of people. You've probably got stories just like these from your own organisations, from yourself, your friends, your family. And this is what we need to encourage. If we're going to achieve these sustainable development goals, uh, even during the time of a pandemic, we need to make sure that we're always encouraging people to believe that they are a global citizen and they do have what it takes to change the world. So I hope that thinking through those mindsets and hearing those stories of what happens when you're a conscious leader has really made you think about yourself, uh, what you could be doing in the ways that you could use what you have uh, right now to change the world. So I will be uh, passing over now to Julia, who's going to talk a bit about some resources to take action as an active citizen. Well, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I can't hear you at the moment, Julia.
Julie is just having a little play around with her settings here so that her audio can come back to us. I'm just taking this time to read through the chat and, um, and to see your great comments on our session. Wonderful initiative, inspiring stories. Love these stories. I mean, we love them too. And um, I've got to tell you that uh, it was really important for us for this session that we tried to give you a snapshot from all over the globe because these kinds of actions are being taken by youth all over the world and in many different organisations. And I know that there are some uh, incredible resources uh, that Julia's organisation used to mobilise particularly uh, young people 18 to 30 to take action. And I think her sounds back and she might be able to introduce them to you now. Yes, thank you so much, Erin, and thanks for your patience, everyone, while we figured that out. But I am back. It was great to hear about the examples, um, both about the leadership model from Erin and then also the examples of young people taking action um, in their communities. And before sharing some resources, I just wanted to quickly go back to the topic of the sustainable development goals. So we now talked a lot about global citizenship and what that means. And you may see that Erin and I are both wearing this very colorful wheel on our lapels, yes. And this very colorful wheel has a very special meeting. I also showed you the SDG four for quality education. And now I wanted to talk a tiny bit about what the sustainable development goals are. So you should be able to see the screen again and reminder that you can go to the bottom right and expand to see it larger if you'd like. So these colorful 17 boxes are the sustainable development goals. They were established in 2015 by the United Nations General Assembly. So it means all the countries that are members of the United Nations agreed all together on this world game plan for addressing and creating a sustainable future for us all. It was during the time that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was serving, and he is also the co-chair of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens and works continuing after his time as Secretary General to continue to empower young people and particularly also women to be active change makers for these goals. So you'll see there's 17 goals. They range from no poverty, zero hunger, to reducing inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, uh, partnerships for the goals, peace, justice, and strong institutions, which definitely relates to the, the human trafficking example that Aaron mentioned as well, and the scouts that took action for this. Uh, life below water, climate action, which is very pertinent to all of us, SDG 13, and taking action for our climate. I suppose many of you already are doing this. Um, there are 169 targets. So these goals alone, underneath each and every one of them, there are 100, there's, there's different targets. So to reduce gender inequalities, we need to, for example, increase women's participation in political processes. We need to reduce gender-based violence and um, violence towards women and girls. This needs to be eradicated to increase gender equality. So under each goal, there are targets. And then 231 unique indicators. So if this is achieved, then it looks like this. This would be the indicator. So it's really a quite complex web of interconnected goals, targets, and indicators. The goal to achieve these is by 2030. And many of you will note that, oh, that's maybe a little under 10 years from now. So we're in the decade of action, as we call it. It's underway. Currently, no one country is on track to achieve all 17 of these goals. But don't be discouraged. Some countries are able to and have achieved some of the goals. Other countries are struggling to remain consistent and some are even slipping backwards with their goals. So there are very clear ways where we all need to improve and we all need to be active global citizens to make these goals a reality. It requires a global citizen mindset, which very much relates exactly to what Erin was sharing about these different leadership skills uh, that we can exhibit, having a gender equality mindset, being collaborative, thinking big picture, thinking how we can be solution oriented together and work with others. This is all key. And each and every one of us can do this locally in our communities. It's not required that we have to solve it on a global level. We can solve it in our communities and that in turn contributes to the goals. They were preceded by the Millennium Development Goals, which maybe some of you have heard of, which were about seven goals. They were much shorter. And they were dealing mostly with poverty eradication. And the good news is, is that extreme poverty existing in the world was halved 
in that time of the Millennium Development Goals. So this, is, this shows us that progress is possible and we absolutely can achieve these goals that I don't want to dishearten anyone. It's possible if we all work together, we can do it. So we're gonna have just two more options for engagement now. I would love to hear which SDGs, oh, some of you have already engaged, which SDGs do you think are most challenged right now? So for those that haven't engaged yet, so is it, is it poverty? Is it hunger? Is it good health and well-being? Because we are, of course, right now dealing with the pandemic, quality education, gender equality. Which SDGs do you think are most important or most challenged right now? You can vote more than once, so it doesn't have to be just one. I'll give a couple more seconds here for you to contribute. And thinking about that the SDGs, as I said, are all interconnected. So as one SDG is progressing, as we're able to achieve, for example, better economic opportunities, we have to make sure that that doesn't have a spillover effect, as we call it, a detrimental effect towards another SDG like climate or responsible consumption and production. So this is where we all have to put on our, our thinking caps and think big picture as global citizens and say, okay, if I do this, is it a good action? Is it having a good impact on everyone? Does it have a spillover effect that's negative for anyone? And that's where we all can in our local communities with our expertise in our local scenarios really be particularly effective. So I see many are, are pointing to, to poverty as still being a topic, um, global health and well-being being of course impacted by the pandemic, gender equality, We've heard that that, is, that has been impacted definitely by the pandemic, um, rising cases of, of, of domestic violence and things of this nature and women having to stay home and take care of things, uh, all things in addition to working. Climate action, yes, because the focus has been elsewhere, but we need to put the focus also back on climate action. So I see that many of you are very familiar with the sustainable development goals already, which is fabulous. One other question I wanted to ask is in which movement related to the SDGs are you most active? Just to get a gauge of, of what are participants today. I see quality education is a passion for many. Human rights, disarmament and security, gender equality, and women's empowerment. Because as Aaron mentioned, it's, it seems that in our group we have these active change makers, whether you're a scout or a member of another youth organization, or just in your own capacity, you're taking action for the SDGs in your community, you are being a global citizen. So this is fantastic to see. Climate action, maybe some of you are part of the Fridays for Future and are, are also doing that in your schools. Women's empowerment and gender equality seems to be a very area where much passion is in this group. That's fantastic. Great. So while you finish um, sharing that, I wanted to take a moment to share, as Erin as had mentioned, some resources that we have at the Ban Ki-moon Center. I also noticed in the q and I can already address this question. We have different programs. Uh, we have scholarships, fellowships, and mentorships where we empower select groups of individuals from different countries with different regional focuses to become active change makers or to scale their impact as change makers as global citizens for the sustainable development goals. Currently, we are collecting applications for our African scholarship program, but that is not the only program we have. You, you can also apply to our fellowship program. We will have one soon for women um, from Latin America. So please be aware and follow us and find out when that's happening. But besides these very specific opportunities where there's um, trainings and workshops and guidance in what we call the implementation of an SDG micro project, which you'll be hearing about in our upcoming panel with our youth representatives, we also have online courses. And our online courses um, are free to take, which is great, and anyone can participate in them. And I highly encourage you to take a look at our online courses and see what we have to offer. We have three different online courses. One is on uh, the sustainable development goals and is through Coursera. And you can imagine that the, the speakers are former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and members of our board. Um, Ahmed Awandawi, who some of you will know, is the Secretary General of the World Scouts organization. And he also is a speaker on our online courses. So you can hear him also speak about the scouting experience and his time as, um, as the youth envoy to the United Nations. 
We also have an online course on gender equality and women's empowerment, which you can access also for free on our website. And we have a third course on global citizenship. And those, the last two, so the women's empowerment and gender equality and the one for global citizenship are with UNESCO APSAYU, which is a Korean, South Korean uh, platform. And they have what is called the Global Citizenship Education Online Campus. So besides our courses, there are tons and tons of resources there. And we always, always encourage uh, um, young people or anyone who's interested in making a difference and taking action for the sustainable development goals to engage with our online courses, to learn more, and then to spot the challenge in your own community and find the solution. So now I will pass back to Erin to share about some toolkits and different tools that um, the WAGS has for your use. And then we'll take a quick break before a panel with a couple youth reps that will give you some more inspiration. Fantastic. Thanks, Julia. So I'm just popping into the chat a link, and it's a link to my facilitator profile here on the Juno platform. And what we've done is we've uploaded six specific resources uh, to the Juno platform that you can access now right away after the session throughout the weekend and I believe after the event. Uh, if something that uh, you've heard uh, from WAGS has really piqued your interest and you want to learn more or find ways uh, maybe to reach out and to see if, um, if you can adapt it to use within your own organisations. So uh, on that page, as I said, I've got six resources up there. Uh, I have uh, our advocacy toolkit, uh, which really speaks about us as an organisation, how we do advocacy and how we encourage our volunteers and young people to take on advocacy. So that's a, a great tool uh, for stepping out. What does advocacy mean? How do we take action in our communities? and breaking it down into really pragmatic steps uh, so that it's designed so that young people can pick it up and take action, um, take advocacy action for issues that they care about. Similarly, there's another toolkit there called Be The Change, uh, which is a, another version uh, that, of a, a toolkit that we use to help enable our young people uh, to take action for the issues which are important to them. Now, I saw there were lots of questions in the chat when we were talking about those six leadership mindsets. And as I said, those mindsets make up what we call our WAGS leadership model. And so I've uploaded to the resources section a document that's a summary of our leadership model. Uh, on our WAGS website, we have some quite detailed uh, examples and resources around this leadership model. This is something that we're encouraging in our 152 member organisations around the globe, um, translated into to all of our official languages. And of course, there's so much more to that model that I can't just give you in a quick 10 minute snapshot on this uh, session, but there are heaps of resources up there about that. And you've also obviously got my contact details there on the facilitator page too, if you want to reach out and ask questions about that. Now, because we are talking about taking action during a global pandemic, I've also included two resources that were put together in really record speed this time last year to, to help us uh, to take action during the pandemic. And uh, I'm sure that in your own organisations, in your own uh, you know, workplaces or schools, things had to be created very quickly uh, during this pandemic, we didn't know how long it would be for, we didn't know what this was going to turn into, but we knew that young people wanted to feel proactive during this time. So the first resource uh, that's up there is something that we call the positivity patrol. Now, the word patrol is a term that we use within Girl Guiding and Girl Scouting for a small group of people. It's a team working together. And the idea was that we wanted to encourage this idea of working together and staying positive. So this resource uh, is in all four of our WAGS languages and it was a way for us to, to use those leadership mindsets to help young people enhance their leadership skills and their resilience in the face of the pandemic. I think last time we checked, the, it was viewed 17,000 times in, in the last 12 months in all those different languages and it was a resource that volunteers were able to pick up and use with young people, but also use with adults 
uh, to help stay positive during this time. And the final document we have up there is something that we called Impact From Home. And it was a practical tool that we put together for girls and leaders to step out how to take safe action during the pandemic. Now, as I mentioned, both of these resources were created last March and April, and they haven't been revised since. So the realities of the pandemic may be quite different uh, from when they were produced, but these resources created impact at the time that they were most needed. And they both drew very heavily on our leadership mindsets because we believe that it was that leadership practice, it was those behaviours that were going to build the resilience needed for people to take action regardless uh, in the face of the time that we are facing. So uh, if you want to check out those resources, you can follow that link uh, or you can search uh, myself or WAGS on the um, Juno platform and you'll be able to find your way to access those. Obviously, there are many other resources on our website, and if you're interested, we would encourage you to check them out. The website is wags.org, so that's W-A-G-G-G-S.org. So with that, we have now been sitting here a solid hour, and I think it is high time for us to take just a quick stretch break, drink break, bathroom break, we have some amazing speakers from the Banky Moon Foundation who are going to chat to you next. So uh, take some time, uh, head off, grab a new drink, have a bit of a stretch. We'll be back in three minutes with our speakers and we really think that you're going to love uh, the stories that they have to tell you about how they are changing the world.
Okay, everybody. Can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you. I hope you're able to stretch your legs and get a sip of water. Uh, now we're going to jump right back in. I would like to invite our two speakers, Rovimbo Samanga and Taftazwa Zashikone, to turn on their video and sound so that we can see them and that they're joining us. Welcome, both of you. Nice to see you. I see Rue, but I don't see Tafadzwa yet. Well, as they get their videos going, I will go ahead and start by introducing you to our two uh, young representatives here uh, that were scholars last year with the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens. First, we have Ruvimbo Samanga. She is a space law and policy analyst from Zimbabwe. She is a consultant for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, a Ban Ki-moon Center Global Citizen Scholar 2020, and a research fellow at the Op Open Lunar Foundation. She's been recognized in the top under 30 African space industry by Space in Africa. She has particular knowledge and issues arising out of the allocation of orbitals, orbital slots and spectrum for developing nations. And her SDG micro project that she'll be sharing with you today is called Agrispace. Welcome, Ruvimbo. <laughs> Next, we have with us Tafadzwa Zahikone. She is a young postgraduate from Zimbabwe as well with interest in civic participation, governance, gender and water issues in the African context. She was a Ban Ki-moon Center scholar in 2020 and her SDG micro project is Water Clicks. I don't know, can they both see me? Can you hear me? Just check and see if they're able to join join um, the, with the video and audio. Well, as they work on getting the connection, I will share with you a little bit about what an SDG micro project is. So an SDG micro project, we're very lucky at the Ban Ki-moon Center to have had almost 100 implemented SDG micro projects by our Ban Ki-moon Center Global Citizen Scholars, Fellows, and Mentee Pairs. And they've reached, so even though it's only been 100 projects, they've reached almost 700,000 individuals. So this should tell you that if you take action, even in a small way in your community, it can have a ripple effect and lead to bigger change um, across. This is all very exciting. Um, our SDG micro projects, um, also here I can show you what a map of our SDG micro projects looks like. So here you can see where they've taken part in different parts of the world. We've had projects in Africa, we've had projects in Europe, in, in Austria, we've had projects in other parts of the world, including in, in Asia and in the Middle East, in GCC countries, and they range anywhere. So it's been in, tw in 23 different countries. They range anywhere from blogging and vlogging about the sustainable development goals to peace building activities in Afghanistan, uh, to a podcast as well about sustainable, called Sustainable Saturdays um, by two, um, two fellows who did this together. We had a mapping project done by an Austrian mentee and mentor of all the SDG micro projects that we have done. We've had projects that have addressed um, the, the wonderful uh, Light to Read project, which is addressing 
um, solar lamps. So getting solar lamps to children in rural areas of Ghana so that they continue learning and reading into the evenings. So uh, let's see if maybe uh, Tafadzwa can join now. I'm seeing that she's raised her hand again. So perhaps this is possible. Thank you to our Juno and our facilitator helpers for helping us get the speakers in um, as they're joining. So we have that and we've also had a wonderful recycling project and incubator project um, out of Ghana as well. So these are just to tell you that these are small projects, but they've had, as I, as I said, 700,000 people reach. So this is really an impressive amount of impact also for taking action in your local community. Good, so let me just go one more time to our website. and share with you how you can learn more and be inspired by other projects that the Ban Ki-moon Center does. So the Ban Ki-moon Center has a variety of online courses, which has already been mentioned. We also have the SDG micro projects, just seems like the window is, is having some difficulty sharing. But on the SDG micro project page, you can see that we have a list of micro projects and actually also an interactive globe where you can see all the different projects that have happened around the world. They've been mapped on this globe and you can take a look at it and learn more. And then you can read about the stories of the individuals that have done outstanding SDG micro projects in their community. So from Mongolia, from Rwanda, from the United Arab Emirates together. Were we able to, to, to have the, the speakers join? So let's see. I see Ravimbo has her hand raised. If the um, assistants could help us bring her into the room. Unfortunately, sometimes we hit technological challenges when we're talking with people all over the world, but this is just a part of what it means to, to be flexible and to be a global citizen. Um, it's, it's tricky, of course. Ah, I think we have Rue. Rue, can you hear us? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, fantastic. I'm glad you were able to join. I already introduced you, and I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about your experience um, as a Global Citizen Scholar and taking action during the pandemic, uh, a little bit about your project, Agrispace. That'd be great to hear. Thank you so much, Julia and Erin, and as well, all of the participants. Thank you for being so patient with me as well as I grapple with my technology. As Julia correctly said, I am in the space industry and I tackle a host of challenges as a policy analyst. And I was quite fortunate enough to be selected for the Ban Ki-moon Global Citizen Scholarship to pursue my SDG micro project, which was tackling SDG number two, that is zero hunger. And how I approached that project was through a community of engagement um, that uses geospatial data, so satellite imagery for farming. And we're hoping through that technological innovation, farmers can um, optimize their productions and have you know, more sustainable yields for the population. And I received the scholarship in 2020 at a time that was very precarious for all of us. And there was a lot of adaptation that had to be done to the project, of course, taking into consideration the socially distanced you know, nature of this pandemic. And it was actually quite um, 
it was actually quite inspiring just the way that it all turned out because at the end of the day, I think we all came to a sense that um, most projects really are scalable in a digital and e-format and that is pretty much what we had to rely on. So instead of you know going out into the field and speaking to farmers in person, we decided why don't we create an ingenious you know, application that they can consult without our human intervention. And having that kind of connection with people so geographically dispersed is such, you know, it's, it's such a momentous feat for a developing country, but I think even more so for youth initiatives, it's the kind of way we need to start thinking. So I would just encourage everyone that when we are looking at, you know, peculiar uh, circumstances like the pandemic or any other kind of uh, socioeconomic shock, we really need to start thinking out of the box and considering how can we make uh, feasible and fundamental human connections with other individuals in a way that we can still bring the impact. That we or indulging in people's food dependent. So some of other ingenious can make meaningful connections and I feel us because we're the most digitally adept generation. So I have found you know a lot of pleasure in being a digital advocate now and I really credit my experience even during the pandemic with the uh, BKMC as one of the really defining moments of my startup career. Thank you so much, Rue. It's great to hear um, also for everyone to, to know how you're able to shift uh, in the moment also and be flexible and find using using digital technology as a tool to your advantage in times where it's hard for us to meet in person, in times where it's hard for us to go and do that in-person interaction that often is a big part of our grassroots level change work. So I think this is a something that everyone should take with them and keep in mind is that use those tools at our disposal, use the, in the, the, um, the different um, apps and different, um, whether it's even as simple as just emailing a survey around to gather information. There's so many different tools to our disposal, so we can still make impact in this way without having to put our, our work on pause. I think we had to pause with for a moment, but then she dropped back off. Uh, Rue, what would you say if, if I were to ask you, how do you encourage other people who are maybe a little bit curious, they're not sure if they're a global citizen or they're, they're a little bit nervous about taking action, how would you encourage them to make a difference in their communities? So I think with any endeavor, you always need a And, you know, three fundamental questions I like to ask myself when considering whether I'm a global citizen or not is firstly, what am I passionate about? Because again, you know, your passion will will never feel like work. Your passion was something that you will continuously feed into regardless of whether there is external validation or, and support or not. And this is the kind of you know resilience that you need to push certain projects forward. And I think that it's important you really ask yourself, what is your core passion? Because again, as young people, we often get caught up in the desire to be, you know, um, too too diversified and, and too multifaceted, which is not a bad thing, but at the same time, we need to focus on what our core competencies are. And the second thing to ask, I suppose, is what does my community need? A global citizen is always thinking, what is the greater picture? What is a way that we can collectively develop in a sustainable way together? And, um, you know, we have the 17 SDGs, which I heard something very interesting in a past conversation, which is the world really only has 17 problems and they're all reflected in the SDGs and are and any other interrelated challenges are linked to those. So think of your community and think what are the SDGs that apply to my community and why would it be important for us to solve this? And then uh, thirdly, your third question should be, what am I good at? You know, so what skills do I have? Perhaps may not necessarily be passionate about it, but this is something that has been honed and trained and, you know, fed into my personal development. And I want to use that for the greater good. So I feel when you answer all three of those questions, you have a greater sense of what your place is in the world as a global citizen. And I think every global citizen should consider those three questions earnestly.
Thank you, Rue. I think this is really a concrete way for you to approach things. So thinking about your passion, like the 17 goals, this is very vast. It's very wide. You don't need to address every single one of them and every target to make a difference, right? You don't need to change the world to be a global citizen. You can change your community and be a global citizen. Um, thinking about your core competencies as well. And what does your community need? So you know best what your community needs. Ravimbo knows best what her community needs. I know best what maybe my community needs. Erin knows best what her community needs. And you, the listener, the participant, know best what your community needs. So take a look, pay attention, see what the issues are and the challenges are for your community. And then look to find partnerships as well are very important. Look for people that can work with you to address those. So whether that's your scout troop or it's someone from the private sector that can take action with you, or uh, even family members and friends, there are ways to make a difference. And then looking at also what you're good at. So if, if you have a background in, in law and in agriculture and space science, then you can clearly apply those skills to working on sustainable agricultural solutions. If you have a background in gender equality work and um, things like this, like myself, then you can apply that to those types of solutions. So take what you know best and try and use it because my guess is, is your skills and talents are really needed in this world. So with that, I think we'll move into question and answer because we're getting close to the end already. And unfortunately, it seems like our other participant wasn't able to join. But I would encourage you now to please, using the chat, send us your questions and we'll do our best to answer. Maybe Erin, you've already noted a couple down and can start answering some. I will head back up the top here. I think some of our moderators have had their eye on the question and may be able to post some into our chat for us to start with. Just scrolling up that chat section now to try and split out the questions from your uh, comments and, and advice regarding our our muting and our sounds, so bear with me as I continue to scroll. Um, also, our moderators uh, on YouTube may have some questions that have come through from our audience uh, on that platform. Uh, let's have a look. There's some questions here about the fellowship for you, Julia, and what is it called? Ah, yes, our fellowship program. So glad to give you a little bit more information. So we have a women's empowerment fellowship program, which we've had two cohorts of in 2019 or in person. These are for selected uh, women, young women from certain regions. So they're always very specific and they're around 20 that are selected for the opportunity includes uh, training courses, both in person and online, and then guidance and support in the implementation of your own SDG micro project um, with the support of the Ban Ki-moon Center. So this is something that we're going to be having launching in May. We will have one for Latin American uh, young ladies. So if that is something that is interesting for you or you know others who might be interested, please follow us on social media and see when we launch the applications, I believe um, near the end of May, and you can apply uh, for this opportunity. It will be also for the 18 and up age range. So the Ban Ki-moon Center does a lot of these training programs, mostly for young professionals and those that are in their university years. So just to be aware, if you're looking for something um, and you're younger than that, uh, that's maybe something to look towards the, the WAGS model and see what other tools you can engage with there. I can see there's a great question here. According to the SDG progress report published by the UN in 2020, it seems that the pandemic has set back the global progress of all of the SDGs. As 2030 draws near, will we be forced to pick and choose which SDGs to prioritise and focus on? Great question and great insight there. And um, I'm used to speaking uh, to particularly quite young people about the sustainable development goals and usually work through an activity with them where we give them all 17 goals and we ask them to place those goals on a ladder from least important to most important 
or from what we're tackling first to what we're leaving till last. So they spend quite a bit of time looking at those 17 goals and working out, well, you know, which one is the silver bullet? Which one do we have to achieve this goal before we can get to that goal, that goal before we can get to that goal? They spend all their time prioritising and then I ask them to turn their ladder on its side because when we're thinking about the sustainable development goals, those goals all intersect and when you take the time to look at the targets and the indicators under each goal, you can see that if you were to draw them together, there would be a, a rabbit warren of, um, of, you know, little paths going between them all. And I think the SDGs have always presented an opportunity for um, different organisations or uh, different governments to need to pick and choose their priorities, but it doesn't obviously prohibit them from working towards other targets. And so while I think that the global pandemic has um, certainly created some real challenges in some specific areas. Uh, I think a silver lining is we've seen some amazing things be achieved during this pandemic that outside of the pandemic we would never thought were possible in the time frame. So hopefully some of those innovations that have taken place, some of our new ways of working and collaborating, perhaps they can actually help us to regain that lost ground. So we may have lost some ground but we've gathered some really valuable new insight and some new ways to collaborate and show that when we're all focused together on one goal, we can achieve some incredible things. So great question, definitely a setback, but also a silver lining, I think, too. Absolutely agree, Erin. And I see um, Filippo in the chat also mentioned, should we address them one by one or in an intersectional way? And I think you answered that very well, that we have to turn the ladder on its side and think about them all as interconnected and parts of one uh, overarching goal for the sustainable future for, for our planet and also for humanity. I also see a question from Dylan asking um, on a personal level, which goals do we think need to be prioritized most globally or most urgent? So maybe Rue, do you have a, a feeling about that and answer which ones are most urgent? We can hear you. Can you hear us? I think her audio might be not connected perfectly, but as far as the most urgent goals, I think many of us um, have heard, especially in the discourse um, right now, it's very important that we tackle climate change. And I see this as a very urgent goal because time has run already quite almost out and we need to take action. And this is why the Fridays for Future movement and Sunrise movements and other movements of young people are so Hello, important. Julia, Aaron, are you yes. both able to hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Did you hear the question as well? Oh, no. Which SDG is most important or most urgent? Ah, <laughs> and the internet strikes again, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I think Ru, Ru would agree that it's climate as well, but, but also education, because um, this is so important as a fundament to being able to achieve the rest of the SDGs. We need to equip young people, and this is exactly the theme, drawing back to the theme of today, global citizenship education, the skills, the values, and the behaviors to actually be able to, to address these SDGs and the challenges that we face. I think this is a, a really opportune moment for us to think about what lens we're viewing the world through. So when I was talking about those mindsets, we were saying that each of them is really a window or a lens through which we can look at our leadership practice. And I think when it comes to the sustainable development goals, we all come to it with our own particular lens. So within my organisation, obviously, we work in a very heavy gender equality space and we're a non-formal education movement. So when we look at the SDGs, we're looking at things like um, education, quality education and gender equality as things that we believe if we can address those, they'll have a flow on effect for those other goals. So it's probably a good opportunity for you to have a think now about your experiences, where you're approaching the SDGs from and therefore which goals become most urgent and relevant to you. Because I think something uh, that was really integral when um, the My World uh, voting was taking place during the later stages of the MDGs to work out what the youth wanted the Sustainable Development Goals to look like, 
Um, it was all about this idea that there are so many issues out there that are front of mind for different people and that by all addressing them at the same time, we can make these great leaps forward. So you, know, you might be looking at those goals and thinking, well, actually, um, I don't think it's climate, I don't think it's gender, I don't think it's education, I think we need to tackle this health thing right now. And there's no right or wrong answer there. It's, it's your lens that you're bringing to it. And as long as you can use your conscious leadership practice to reflect on why you might be seeing things that way and what you can do about it, then it's perfectly reasonable for every person in this session here to have a completely different way to tackle it and us all be working on the same set of outcomes. I think that's a fantastic way of describing it, the different lenses we can put on. Well, we are, we are at the end of our allotted time. Um, we've come to the end of a very engaging session, I think a very hopefully thought-provoking session for each and every one of you where you've gotten some ideas, some inspiration. Um, despite the technical difficulties, uh, I do encourage you to all visit um, both the page of Aaron and myself on the Juno platform, if you're on the platform, to see the other resources we have but also to go to the website. So the bankhumancenter.org or wags.org as well, I believe. Um, so this will be where you can find all of the resources that were talked about today to learn more about the SDG micro projects and what those are of the Ban Ki-moon Center to get more inspiration. Um, and we wanted to leave you with a final, um, a final sentence <clears throat> of inspiration, but we wanted to leave you with something. And uh, Aaron, I'll turn to you for your, your final thought for the group. Gosh, I have so many thoughts. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Again, your engagement has been incredible and insightful and we hope that you have found uh, this session useful. Um, so when Julia asked me to consider what my final call to action would be, um, I've, I've landed on, on this as my final thought for you all. So if nothing else from attending this session, I hope that you'll remember that everyone, no matter what their age, has the ability to be a global citizen and a change maker. And that by taking the time to encourage and enable young people to consciously practice and develop leadership behaviors, we can build a community of young people who can take action for a better world. Thank you, Erin. That's great inspiration words to leave us with. Um, I would just add in addition to that, another, another uh, from my side, is that you don't have to change the world to be a global citizen. If you look in your communities and you spot the challenges in your communities and work to address them, you are a global citizen. Please take that to heart. I hope by the end of this session, many of you who were not sure if they were a global citizen or put maybe in the poll, that now you could self-identify and say, yes, indeed I am. And with that, we wish you a really wonderful rest of the summit, um, continued engagement, continued inspiration, and thank you so much for joining us today. Bye everyone.